Hi guys, and welcome to another exclusive Metal Blast interview. If you're a regular, you know that we don't normally do introductions to our interviews, however, in this occasion, I need to give you a little heads up. As I am sure you will notice, both the beginning and the ending of the interview feel quite abrupt. This happened because of some scheduling conflicts that we encountered at the venue and which forced us to push our interview back a couple of hours. So by the time we met with Steven, our time started to quickly collide with that of the sound checking, so we had to wrap up everything as fast as possible. Still, Steven met with us for about 30 minutes, which I believe was the longest time he gave to any of the journalists present at the venue that day. So don't get the wrong impression because of the lack of pleasantry. Steven is a great guy, it was really fun to hang out with him, and if you have an opportunity to meet with him, which I believe you can do throughout the signing sessions as he's doing in his German tour and that he will continue doing probably in his European tour, don't hesitate to do it as I am sure you will not regret it. I'm also going to go ahead and test your patience a little bit more and invite you guys to like us on Facebook and to subscribe to us on YouTube. We have some great material coming your way. We're going to interview Catatonia, Lacuna Coil and some other bands in November and December. And we're also going to soon post some interviews that we already conducted with bands like Paradise Lost and Sepultura. So please go ahead and check us out. There are links in the description and I am sure you will find something that you will be interested in. So without further ado, here is the interview with Steven Wilson, a man with over 40 albums under his belt. Uh, where he acted as producer, musician, or both, who has worked with bands like Opeth, Pendulum, and many others. He is the mastermind behind Porcupine Tree and, of course, the Stephen Wilson solo project. So please enjoy. The Raven That Refused to Sing was released also in this uh, deluxe edition that right. came with all the Hager Miller uh, drawings. Do you usually encounter that? <laughs> Be because they, they complemented the music actually very, very, very well. It, mm -hmm. it, it increased the experience of the, mm -hmm. of the album. So, or do you usually find that your music actually need uh, sort of an extra media to be able to, to really convey the message to the uh, fans? I'm not sure if need is the right word because I mean, you know, I think the music ultimately has to stand up on its own anyway. Um, but I think I've always liked the idea of multimedia. If you see the show tonight, you'll see the films, projections, images are all part of the show. I think there is a sense that when you have more than one media together, if they do somehow complement each other, you have something that is stronger mm -hmm. than either individual element alone. And I think that's true of the music. I think the music is definitely enhanced by uh, the visual representation, particularly with this particular concept, because this concept is like this kind of idea of ghost stories. The idea came very early in the process of writing the music. We're going to have a book. We're going to have a book of ghost stories. That's going to be the the concept. So I think from that point on, it became a multimedia project. You know, right from the, from the very early days, it was conceived as a multimedia project. But that's not to say you use the word need. That's not to say that I don't think the music, I think the music does still stand up on its own. I hope so, you know, that you can just listen to it on the radio or on your, your iPod or whatever, and it still works musically. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the iPod. You, have, you actually, uh, in one interview, you mentioned that uh, you don't really make the music for the iPod. That, uh, that, no. that yeah, you think that the music, it, it, it should be this physical media uh, that, that sort of enhances the musical experience. Yes. Uh, has, because now, of course, your music is available in Spotify and iTunes, etc. Has your opinion changed? On the no, time? no, it hasn't changed and it never will change. But that doesn't mean that I don't still have to... I mean, if you're an artist and you want to share your work with as many people as possible, which most artists do, uh, you have to embrace whatever you need to embrace in order to reach people. And unfortunately for me, I live in a world where download culture and streaming culture is, is here to stay. Uh, iPods are the dominant form that people listen to music now. I can no longer kid myself that people listen to vinyl records at home or 5.1. You know, there are there's a small group of audio files that will always listen to those things, of which I'm a, a part. But the majority of people listen to music streaming on their laptops or, 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 or from MP3s on their iPods. I have to accept that, so I can't cut myself off to it, but I don't have to like it. And, and I still think it's a very poor substitute for uh, a high quality experience. It, you know, the best analogy I can give is it's like looking to a, it's like looking at a terrific painting, amazing painting, as a JPEG on your phone. It's the same thing. You can still appreciate it's a good painting, 
but you're not getting any of the quality of experience you would get if you saw it hanging in, a, in, a, in an art gallery with the light reflecting off it, texture of the paint, the way it's framed. You're not getting any of that, but you can still appreciate it. It's a good painting. And I think it's the same with a piece of music. You can still like a song. I can listen to a song on my phone. That's a good song. But the quality of experience is way down, you know, compared to listening to it in 5.1 or from vinyl on a good good hi-fi. So I continue to preach, if that is the right word, I continue to preach the idea of, of you know, high quality audio experience. When you, uh, so is there a certain frustration on your part? Of that, course, yeah. That you, you do know that most fans probably yeah. have the first experience with Stephen Wilson or with most music yeah. through MP3s or YouTube even. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating, but like I say, there's no point crying about it. You know, I, I, I just keep, I keep trying to promote the idea of, of you know, high audio by continuing to release 5.1 mixes, by continuing to do these beautiful, elaborate special editions. So I keep trying to, and I think it's working, you know, because I see kids coming to me now with the, the vinyl and the, and the special edition. And when I see kids coming to me, I know that there's some appeal to people who have no nostalgic attachment to vinyl. I mean, that it, it's one thing when I, like a 50 year old guy comes to me with a vinyl, I can understand that because he has a kind of nostalgic attachment to vinyl from, from his, his past. But a, ki a, a young kid now coming to me with a piece of vinyl, that's not because he's nostalgic for vinyl, that's because he's just looked at it and, and appreciated it as something beautiful and something that he wants to own, something he wants to he or she wants to treasure. And I think that that message gradually does get through, not, not to the majority, of course, but to a substantial minority, shall we say. We mentioned the audiophile community. Now, you, you're someone that actually knows about the, the topic of production and, and sound quality, etc. Right. But uh, you, you do, I mean, do you usually encounter that within the audiophile community there is actually a lot of Bullshit, like the monster cables. And yeah, no, they talk. They talk a lot. They talk a lot about things that they they know about, but they also talk a lot about things they really have no idea what they're talking about. You know, and I and I I have been on a few forums that are dedicated to it, and there's a lot of people that that say things as if it's fact, and it's just such utter nonsense. And it's it, it's really hard to resist the temptation to go in and start correcting. No. You, but the, you know that's that again. That's the world we live in. We live in a world where there are a lot of people now communicating onto the internet, and there's a lot of what you might call disinformation, and misinformation, and misinformed people. I don't recall exactly what author it was, but he mentioned that the problem with the internet is that it's the sort of cult of the amateur. Since everyone yes. has a voice, if yes. everyone thinks that they're on the same playing field. Yes. Well, that I think I, I, I said that with relation to, to in relation to journalism, which I think prob the problem now you have is that you used to have professional journalists, people who actually were very good and very articulate at writing about music. Now you have five billion music journalists, potentially five billion music. I can go online now and I can Google the Raven Refused to Sing review. I will find thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people all expressing their opinion about that album. And every single one of them will be expressing their opinion as if it's fact. Like, this album sucks. This album is fabulous. This track's the best track. This track's the worst track. No, this track's the best. And I think that's one of the things about, about you know, opinion is that with human nature, we tend to express our opinions very much as if, most of the time we express our opinions as facts. We don't say, well, it's just my opinion, but we sometimes we do, but really we do. If somebody comes to us and says, what do you think of the new Metallica album? Shit. It's not my opinion, but I don't, you know, in my opinion, it's not good. But um, most of the time we tend, as human beings, we tend to, our, our impulse is to say something as if it's a definitive fact. And that's the problem with, with the internet is that you have a lot of people all expressing completely contrary opinions but each of them is convinced that they're right and that theirs is the only possible standpoint. The problem with the audiophile community is that there actually are things that should be facts, that there are things that are incontrovertible fact, but that people get wrong and start spout. You know, I find, because I do a lot of remixing work for classic albums, and I find that a lot of people don't even understand the difference between mixing and mastering. Now, I'm not sure that they should do. I'm not sure they should need to. But at the same time, there's a lot of people talking with great authority about these things, and I realise they don't even understand the difference yeah, between I do. mixing and mastering. I did read an interview, and you were, at least in my opinion, you, you, you were starting to get a bit 
bothered because he kept saying remastering. Right, and so I don't do I mastering. I don't do remastering. I don't. In I fact, don't. I don't like mastering. In fact, I bypass, I, on my records and on my remixes, I actually bypass the mastering stage completely because I don't like mastering, really. So the fact that he kept referring to what I was doing as remastering, I'm guessing, if you, I, I, as many times I've been in that position in interviews. And that does irritate me because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a very fundamental difference between remixing and remastering. But I think remastering has become like a buzzword because it's not down to the, the, the people that buy the records. It's, it's the problem is the record companies. They put these buzzwords on the front of digitally remastered. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything really. But people pick up on that and then they start to, you know, perpetuate these phrases. Oh, yes, it's been remastered. Uh, but do you actually know what that means? And a lot of people don't, clearly don't, you know. Yeah, I, I do encounter that when it comes to uh, especially album reviews. People like to use buzzwords. Buzzwords, They, they yeah. don't actually understand what, what it means. I no. have read a lot of reviews that, that talk about, that, that use adjectives that, that I've actually had to tell them, like, that doesn't even mean what you think right. it means. Well, Frank Zappa referred to music journalism as people who can write, interviewing people who can talk or people who cannot read. Yes, and he also said that writing about music was like dancing about architecture. And, and I think that's also just as valid. You know, the, the whole idea of writing about music is absurd. Of course it is. How can you put something into words that, is, that, that cannot possibly be articulated in words? But still, we have a whole industry of music journalism that, that tries to do that. And I think some of them do it very beautifully, you know. There are some music writers that I think are poets, you know, they write beautifully about music, almost to the point where you, when you hear the music you're disappointed because it doesn't, doesn't sound as good as your description, you know. But I think that there are now, because we, because we have the internet, we have a whole world full of people writing with so-called seeming authority about their opinions about music. And I think there is a lot of noise now in the world that you have to cut through, a lot of bullshit you have to cut through. You know, the simple truth is you need to hear. But, you know, as you kind of pointed out, a lot of people don't listen to music. They, they kind of hear music with their eyes, not with their ears. So they read reviews and they perpetuate that opinion of other people. And it would just be nice if some people sometimes would just listen, you know, make up their own minds rather than sort of, as you say, catching on to these buzzwords. And but one of the problems I think with reviews is that it often happens that if you read that a bunch of people said that the album is bad, when you're going to listen to it, you're going to think it's bad. It's sort of the self-fulfilled uh, or, prophecy. Or you might, you might feel the opposite. I think sometimes when you read a lot of bad stuff, you come to something and you have a, like a bias because you think it's going to be terrible because you've heard... And it's not as bad as you, as you expect it to be. And you're like, actually, you know, this is really good. So I think it can work both ways, you know. But I think you're right that there is no such thing really in this world as a completely unbiased, unprejudiced listen to any new music. When I come, for example, when I come to listen to the new Nine Inch Nails album, for example, which I did, I have very high expectations because I'm a fan. And to be honest, I was disappointed by those. I didn't think the new album was as good as Trent Reznor could and should do. But if that had been Ministry making that new record, a band who I didn't really think were very good, I'd have probably thought it was the best thing they'd ever done. So you see what I mean? So I think every, and it's the same with, you know, when people come to my music, some of them uh, maybe thought the last album was, was fantastic and they're looking for a bit more of that fix, you know, and the new record's a bit different, so maybe they're disappointed. So I think everyone has, I think the point I'm making is everyone comes to music with some kind of agenda. One of the things that I have realized uh, is that a musician can never satisfy the fan base no. because on the one hand there are those that are going to say you know you mentioned maybe there are those who love the the previous album mm -hmm. so they want you to do the same yeah well there are those who didn't like it and they want you to do something different yeah you can you can never ever please everyone and I think it's futile in a way to ever try to think about pleasing your fans because you will fail you will fail every album I've made Every album I've made, and I've made some ridiculous amount of albums, something like 40 albums in my career. Every album I've ever made, I can find someone that thinks it's the best thing I've ever done, and I can find someone that thinks it's the worst thing I've ever done. And so in that, straight away, you, you appreciate from that that it's pointless to even try to make music for anyone else but yourself. So I make music for myself, and it's a very selfish thing to do, but I think it's the only way to make music, is to do it for yourself. Well, I wanted to actually mention this because you, you, you've said that the point of your music is to share it. 
you want as an artist you want to share your music and there's the paradox there, there is the contradiction that the impulse to make music is a very personal one to, to do something that you yourself can feel proud of and happy with but at that point the natural extension of that is now I want to share it with as many people as possible and, and that is a kind of it's almost like a Faustian pact you know it's like I'm going to do something for myself but I'm also going to put it up there to be shot down by other people and say that shit you're wasting your time or that's great and I think that is the great conundrum and the great paradox of being an artist is that, is that narcissistic need to see yourself reflected back in the mirror by other people's opinions and other people relating to what you do have you ever been I'm not going to say offended but hurt by, by seeing that someone did not appreciate your every, music every 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 listen any any musician that tells you that they're not offended by even the most innocuous criticism by some 12 year old kid living in a basement in Utah that writes a review on the internet that's negative even the most thick skinned artists I think would still find that hurtful in a way it's not nice I mean just I think the thing the thing you have to think of it is music if you if you're an artist that makes music from a very personal place which I think the most of the ones that are worth talking about do when someone criticizes your music they're criticizing you they're criticizing your personality they're criticizing your whole essence and your whole being if you don't take those things personally then you're not human in a way you know so I think it's only natural and there are many people that have struggled with that you know, I, I have many friends who are musicians and they've, they've made records and they've, they've put their heart and soul into them and they've struggled with this, this uh, criticism that they've then received when they've held up their work to be judged by other people and it's actually driven them away from, from doing any more because it's so hard. It's one of the hardest things you ever come to terms with is holding up your music to be judged by other people in a negative or a positive way and you cannot expect it ought to be positive. But does it even become? But but throughout, you know, you've mentioned forty albums, so eventually it becomes easier for you. Like you'd no longer give this because at first I assumed that someone saying this is not a good record, even if they said it properly or improperly, hurts more than when you know that you have a big. I think so. I think I know. Yeah. Okay. I think I I've been doing it long enough to know that my work is is good, um, and that if somebody doesn't like it it's because it's not what they want from it or because they have um, other, some other personal vendetta against me they think I'm arrogant they don't like you know what I've done to Opeth and there's lots of death metal fans who hate me because I made Opeth soft you know so you, you have to start taking all those things and by the way it wasn't me that did that it was Michael's choice anyway but you have to take all those things into consideration that there are people who may have a prejudice against you which has nothing to do with the quality of your work at all um, there are people who are jealous of me because I'm, they see me as being successful and they, they think their band that's not successful should be, should be doing, you know, doing what I'm doing. But So all of those things can, can lead to people being negative about you. So I think you get to the point where you're able to di distinguish and discern whether there is an agenda, whether it's simply that the music doesn't appeal to that person, uh, you know, and, and, and I suppose in that respect you do gain some kind of wisdom. Do you eventually uh, encounter a criticism that you think that actually makes sense? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, in a sense, all criticism does make sense, you know. Yeah, but uh, you know, what we mentioned about this cult of the amateur. The, the, you the, mean the a, criticism, a criticism that you actually say, he's right, I should do something about right, that. Right, as opposed to the 12-year-old kid who's, you know, you yeah, suck, never do music again and die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a proper yeah, of criticism. Course, of course, yeah. No, actually, those reviews don't bother me. Those kind of reviews are just funny. But it's the reviews where they try to rationalise and reason what, what they're saying. Um, yes, I've taken, uh, I've taken some things and, and read them and said, you know what, there is something about that. But um, I don't necessarily think you should ever change your music uh, for any other reason than you believe it's the right thing to do for you, you know. So... Yes, the answer to the question is yes, there have been criticisms that I have acknowledged and actually acknowledged to myself, I feel the same way. Um, you know, and it is, a, it is a path of trial and error. You know, you do things and, and in retrospect sometimes you, you, I have certainly dismissed things I've done in the past as being failures. Um, but it usually takes me at least five years to be able to look at something with that degree of objectivity 
and say, you know what, that wasn't that 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 record didn't work, or that I didn't achieve what I was trying to do there. What What do you think has been a failure of making Opeth soft now? No, in fact, I, I'm very proud. In fact, I I didn't make Opeth soft. Michael had already decided to do oh, that. Blackwater Park is an amazing yeah. album. There's no question about it. It's a great record. Yeah. No, I mean, I that's certainly not a failure. No, no. I mean, I'm talking about records I've made myself. That some of which I'm I I, I think are not as good as they should have been. I don't want to name names because you know there'll be somebody out there reading this that that'll be their favorite album. And if I say, I, you know, I, I hate it when artists I like say that the album, you know, that I really love and they say, oh, I sucked, that was the worst thing we ever did. And it's so depressing to hear that, you know, oh, I love that record, you know. So Roger Waters talking about Atom Heart Mother, you know, pick, he said, oh, that's a piece of shit, it should have been buried in the ground, you know. I love that record, how can you say that? You know, so I don't want to, I don't want to do that and then find somebody loves the record I'm slacking off. Moving a little bit to a different subject, you've yeah. been very vociferous in criticisms to this, uh, the dumping down uh, of the, the musical landscape like right now with stuff like uh, American Idol, The X Factor, right. etc. So we do see that, well you've said that it's a way in which the record industry tries to control, uh, re regain the control of, of the right. musical landscape. At the same time, however, we do see that your album did very, very well. Now, Dream Theater, the, the latest album, did excellent. Mm. Uh, it, it charted very well on, mm. the, on Billboard. Mm. So you think that it might be, it is a sign of ch a changing trend, or rather that bands such as Dream Theater, Opeth, Catatonia, Steven Wilson, would always have a niche to which they appeal? I think it's a sign that the music business uh, has become... Um, very schizophrenic and has kind of diversified into two very distinct halves. On the one side you have a populist mainstream culture, you have pop idol, American idol, you have you know most of the records you'll hear on on mainstream radio you know which are so they sound like records made by computers to me you know the, the voice is like a synthesizer, The the you mean autotune? Autotune, oh, Melodyne, all that stuff. But all those records have that. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the music that is completely outside of the mainstream, which is most rock music today. There's very little rock music in the mainstream at all. Most rock music, which, which is discovered by means of, usually by word of mouth, friends introducing other friends to the music. And that also continues to grow. And I think what happens is the more extreme the one thing becomes, the more there is a swing in the other direction for people who really are looking for the antidote and the alternative to that. And they find it. They find it in my music, they find it in Opus music, and Dream Theater Dream music, because this is the music that's completely anti-mainstream in a way. I mean, you say, okay, my album did very well in Germany, Dream Theater's album's done very well in Germany, but still, you won't see us in the mainstream. You won't hear us on the radio, you won't see us on MTV. And I think that's the difference, that there are bands that are selling records because there is a cult and a kind of word of mouth thing going on. And those are the people that are sick of the other shit, you know, the kind of American Idol stuff. And I think that division becomes more and more polarized as time goes on. And I say that because there was a time, I remember growing up, there was a time when there was such a thing as the um, experimental mainstream. Bands like Talking Heads, bands like The Police, um, bands like Talk Talk that were having hits but actually were really intellectually and, inspir and in you know, interesting musically, experimental. That's disappeared. That's disappeared. We now have the extremes and you will not hear those kind of artists now in the mainstream. Some people say Arcade Fire, you know, you know th th those kind of bands, Radiohead, but I think even those bands are much more marginalised now than they perhaps would have been in the 80s or even in the 90s. The thing is that uh, I guess that well, the, there are economic reasons by which some bands that were actually on the outside of the mainstream suddenly decided to get into the the mainstream. We, we right. saw it with Metallica, we saw it sadly with Ozzy Osbourne, uh, with even with Zach Wilde from right. Uh, right. from Black Label Society. Uh, I, I was talking with Nick Holmes from Paradise Lost last week, and, and we talked about how one of the problems with even with rock music to some level, and basically with every genre of music, is that there tends to be sort of this industrialization of rebellion so that we, mm. we created a socially acceptable uh, mm. uh, re rebellious uh, imagery and sort of a music that ends to aim constantly at the lowest common denominator right uh, it, it was sad to see it for instance when you think of the origins for instance of rap and hip-hop it right. tends to be music that talks about the struggles of the of the black people in the United States and now it turns into something that I have a lot of money and I fuck a lot of 
Yeah, yeah it's all bling and it's all bling and it's all fuck you. All the all the guys I left back in the hood, fuck you. I've got money now. Yeah, I, I don't understand that. Um, I think things are changing. Rock mu- There used to be a lot of encouragement for rock musicians to act like rock stars. There isn't anymore. And I think what's changed is that it's now the rappers that are acting like rock stars. Um, and that's very interesting. It's a very inter- interesting cultural shift that rock musicians, in a way, are being encouraged to act like the opposite of rock stars. We're being encouraged to do meet and greets with our fans, to do blogs where we talk about our home life, and to see, you know, we see Ozzy Osbourne act, you know, acting like a, a buffoon in his home, you know, unable to operate the remote control on his TV. So all this kind of thing, for me, is like a way of making rock stars, what you, the people that used to be rock stars, just like regular people. Hey, they just, they're just like us. They're idiots like us, you know. And I think actually, inter- interestingly and contradictorily, that has been a kind of, that has had an adverse effect on rock music. The, it's been demythologized now to the point actually where I think it's become quite marginal. And the rappers are very clever because they understand that, that whole thing. Hey, I've got money. I'm a fucking star. I've got chicks. And actually, at the end of the day, that's what creates the mythology of pop music. And that's... So the, the, the now we have the black version of Poison and Motley Crue and uh, Prison of Fire. Absolutely. Yeah, we have these kind of people who are acting like almost like archetypes, like stereotypes, like rock stars. You know, like the way Kiss would have acted like in the 70s. And Which uh, music has become a little bit like Spinal Tap. In the, uh, well, I think Spinal Tap in a way has, has probably got, got to take some of the blame for... I mean, I love that movie, everyone does, but I think in a way that was the beginning of the demystification of the rock star. And the dismantling of the whole kind of the, the the myth of the rock star with the chicks and the cocaine and this and the, the kind of somehow like he's not one of us he's like a god and I think that it was right in a way that that should have been dismantled because it's complete bullshit you but don't it, have a bunch of women and cocaine in your afraid not no I was hoping <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time I think that while that needed to happen there's no doubt that it has resulted in what we have now which is a kind of uh, a demystification to the point that actually the kids no longer really are attracted very much to to the the idea of the rock the rock musician and the rock star anymore. Uh, maybe it's for the best in the long run, uh, but you know it, it's like today I was doing a, an in store appearance, you know, and I was signing stuff and talking to fans stuff like that. I'm not sure Jay Z would do that, you know, or, or uh, Kanye, you know, just hang out with his fans like that. Uh, you know, but but I have to do those things because that's the only way that rock musicians like me now can survive is by interacting with their fans. But beyond survival, do you like to be able to actually come to come closer to that? Do I like it? I feel uncomfortable with it. I wouldn't say I'm not. I'm not going to say I don't enjoy meeting people because I do, and I'm not going to say I don't enjoy meeting my fans because I do. But at the same time, I feel very uncomfortable with it uh, because it's not. Well, it, it's not a natural way to meet someone. You're meeting someone that knows everything about you, you know nothing about them. And it's very, it can be awkward. It's very awkward. If you ever met somebody that so nervous to meet you, they're actually shaking, they can't. How do you interact with someone like that? You make me nervous. You're, you're nervous, you make me nervous. That's not a natural way to. I mean, I love to meet people, but I love to meet people, you know, kind of on equal footing. And some people are so they still believe in the idea of the rock star. So the first thing I do is I try and make them understand that that's bullshit, you know. But again, coming back to that thing, it's the more I do that, the more people, people make, I make people realize I'm just a guy, the less, the, the more we kind of erode this idea of the magic of rock music and the mythology of rock music and that, that kind of, you know, Led Zeppelin were gods and Black Sabbath were gods and the Beatles were gods. Well, we don't have those rock stars anymore. There is one more thing I wanted to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there were a bunch, but to finish with this one, uh, both in your solo work and in Porcupine Tree, uh, lyrically you've said that you feel more interested to sad and melancholic things mm-hmm. because actually happy music makes you, makes you mm-hmm. sad. Uh, there are some peer-reviewed articles that do trace a link between mental diseases and suicidal ideation and uh, sort of this dark music, be it metal, alternative rock, and for some reason also country music. It's okay. those three ones. Right. Uh, the, the question is always, what, what, what is the relation? Is it a causal relation as this type of music causes suicidal ideation, or people with problems tend to be attracted to this type of music? 
I think it's. I think it comes up to something I said earlier about you know about looking in the mirror. And I think what happens with music is it's it's something that creates an an empathic sort of response in whoever listens to it. You either relate to it or you don't. See, for every example of someone that you could give me of someone that actually became more depressed about listening to sad music, I can give you an example of somebody that actually understood from listening to that music that they were not alone in feeling that way, and it made them feel better. So. I think it, you know, I think all it does is it tends to amplify what's ever there already. I think that for a lot of people, the, the experience that I've had is that it is some music that you feel attracted to when you are down, but at yes. the same time it does create this cathartic effect that you, I think you exactly. have mentioned, which is, exactly. I'm not the only one. I'm not alone, that. and this guy understands me, and he understands what I'm going through. I feel better. There's always going to be people who take it the other way, you know, as a kind of... Uh, kind of a validation of their own suicidal impulse or whatever. But I think, you know, ultimately those people are on a, on a kind of destructive path anyway. Um, you know, and let's face it, if you, t if you, you know, if you take anything that a rock, st a rock star says seriously, you're an idiot. Because we're not poets. But do you want to be We're not seriously? poets. Well, I mean, yes, to an extent. Can we talk about Fear of a Blank Planet, you know, which is a song... It's a message, it. yes. It, I like the idea that it might make people think about those things and start talking about those things, yes. But I'm not a poet, you know. I'd rather you go and read Christopher Hitchens or someone who's like, really, you know... But at least I can scratch the surface with it. And I understand that my audience is, you know, it might be a lot of kids who are still finding their own way and defining their own personality and their own perspective on life. And if I say to them, do you know what, do you really think staying in your bedroom 24 hours a day playing computer games and communicating with your friends on, on email is a good way to go about your life? And just if somebody says, you know what, there's something worth talking about there. Well, was it interesting for you to see that you were connecting with kids? Uh, because you were already in, in your 40s when you did Hero of Blank Planet. Do you usually, do you encounter younger kids that do come to you and say, you get me yeah, of course. Them. I have had those people. I had a lot of kids. I mean, one of the jokes with with uh, Fear of Blank Planet Inside Hentis was the thing about the the uh, hating the iPods. I had loads of kids start to bring me their iPods to destroy, you know, which was funny. You there know, were very angry parents somewhere in that equation. Yeah, probably. But you know what? It was a funny thing. You know, that that just something I meant as a kind of joke, but people took it seriously. And, and I, in a way, I'm glad they took it. They took it seriously. You know, so. Did they bring you their pornographic magazines for destruction? They didn't, didn't bring pornographic they magazines. Brought, they, no, they brought the boring stuff. No. Yeah, they only brought the Xbox. And I the know. Zero Just the boring stuff. Right. Yeah, I know. It's pathetic, isn't well, it?